Scratch, I'd like to share with you how I made half a dozen boulders to hold the Basket Hill Claymores my son's bridesmaid will be carrying in his upcoming wedding. Along the way, we'll talk about talking, some historical bridal traditions, and the thrill of figuring out a challenge. What's a Baldrick? No, not here. Sorry. A Baldrick is a shoulder belt used to carry a sword all the Ren Fair types have to keep their weapons close at hand. One of the bridesmen suggested that we use the tartan as a baldric, which I think is a brilliant idea, except how do I do that? I've never made one before, in fabric or in leather. That would be a challenge. Now, I'm familiar with what a baldric is, being a Ren Fair brat myself from an early age, and I'm very pleased that my family think I can do anything crafty related to fabric or anything else, but how to account for the differing height and girth of six sword-wielding companions? We should see. I would like to thank the Celtic Croft on Etsy for their wonderful hand-woven yards of our tartan, which can't be found in the plaid section of their local fabric shop. They did a beautiful job of this medium-weight wool blend. It has a wonderful hand and is very sturdy and durable, which is what I hope for in using a wool blend. Now, speaking of tartans, before the Prescription Act against wearing tartans in 1746, there were no clan tartans as such, with the possible exception of the Royal Stuart. Regions had their own preferred colors. For instance, the Hebrides preferred blue, green, and black, like the Campbell or Black Watch tartans. And individuals had their own preferred colors and scents. Donald Gordon Moore MacDonald of Slate preferred red and black to show off his very blonde hair blue eyes, and white skin. Several of the modern MacDonald tartans are based on these colors and sets. The set is the pattern of stripes, their thickness and colors, and whether they are symmetrical. The weave of tartan is twill, which is diagonal, and the term plaid originally referred to a very long length of wool, which was wrapped around in a sort of cloak or brought, which developed into the great plaid, the filipore, thick outlander, and then into the little kilt or the bag, which is what most people wear today. Speaking of Outlander, before the Sobieski brothers popularized tartan in the early 1800s, there were no weathered, ancient, or hunting tartans. Examples from the 18th century are fairly bright, as we can see from paintings. The muted colors of some extant pieces are due to fading. It was and is very possible to get really bright colors from natural dyes. From using plants, yes, but they also had mineral dyes as well. Mind you, of the several tartans my family are so-called entitled to wear, I prefer the weather examples because they suit me better. And every member of my family has their own particular favorite, which is much more in keeping with the ancient usage. Clearly, being surrounded by tartan from birth affected my son's choice in using it in his wedding, and I am very grateful to his lady love that she's game for everything that comes with a D&D playing, red fair working, sword wielding throwback. The basket hill claymores that the bride men are carrying developed in the 16th century as a military weapon and were in wide use by the 18th century. Being lighter, than the two-handed Highland Claymore. In being carried by the bride men, the tradition demonstrated a pledge of fealty to the new couple, which was meant literally from the Iron Age through to the early modern period. That's the Tudors. It was common to have six or eight bride men shelter the new couple in an arch of swords as they exited the church. Again, a sign of protection and loyalty. Why am I calling them bride men and not groomsmen as in the modern usage? Well, firstly because this is not a modern wedding, as if that weren't obvious. Dr. Samuel Johnson, in his famous Dictionary of 1755, defined the term as attendance on the bride and bridegroom. Shakespeare uses the term with abandon. But the earliest usage I was able to find was in the Encyclopedia Judaica in the middle of the 13th century. In this context, the bride man was a friend, not of the bride, but of the groom, and he paid for and arranged the wedding out of his own money and would be repaid someday 
by the groom. So, onward to making this supposedly simple little swab of fabric. Come through the heather, Arundum, gather your other welcome or early. Arundum, fling, we are your kin for Wally King, the jelly. The first thing that I needed to do was to cut more lengths of the tartan because the ones that I had made for the wrap around ties weren't long enough even for me to go around as a bulwark. So, cutting on the same line that I did for the original, I cut out another half a dozen, but I cut them on the cross grain this time instead of the lengthwise thread. So they were a bit shorter than the original. Do this five more times. There we go. What I found out with this was that the lengths were actually a bit different. This is what happens when you have hand woven things. It worked out okay. I can plug it when I'm sewing them together. But it was a little bit of a surprise because when you cut something out, it's made like this on a full read, and you expect it to be the same. No, it wasn't. But it's okay. Off to the sewing machine. This is my new singer. Well, it was new in 1958. It is a 401A, and I got it on eBay because I had an estate sale, and somebody actually took the uh, my old 401A, which I was very upset about um, because it wasn't supposed to go in the, you know, the general release of objects that I own. So I was very happy to find this on eBay with all of the bells and whistles, the little box of um, accompaniment and the cans and very few that originally came with it. It is called the last of the vintage singers because it is the last fully metal machine that singer made. Um, my mother had the next one, which was a Rocketeer, the 501, and that had some plastic parts to it. Here we are, pinning them together, the ends, and this is where I found out, oops, that they were actually different. As I said, it really wasn't a big deal because I could fudge it and sort of squadge them together. But, uh, yeah, I was a little perfect when this first happened. As you'll notice, um, I am wearing different things because I had a uh, recording disaster. That was fun. Um, so I had to record all of this. And I on after it was sent um, <laughs> into the netherworld. Um, putting out the pins. What I had to figure out here was how exactly am I going to wodge this about so that it would be a sort of coaster shape. And that's what I'm trying to figure out here. I need to make an end uh, here that can fold over so it doesn't travel. So there I'm doing that. Trying to place it all nice and neat. See here, I know what I need to do, sort of. And I do a lot of with this. Because goodness knows I'm not a freak about getting everything perfect or anything like that. There we go. Pin it all neatly and nicely. Um, actually, just like everybody else, uh, I, I will plug things. Mm didn't do uh, internal seam finishes for a long, long time. I've been sewing since I was about 12, and I maybe started doing seam finishes on things that seemed important to me about 10 or 15 years ago. 
And it was only when I made really important things, like my wedding dress and things like that, that I actually bought it to finish the scene. And, oh, really, shaking the camera, very good. And that would be my dog, who you saw um, at the sewing machine. So, yes, it very neatly and precisely. Um, and all of them are made in the very same way. And see me doing that later on, and using the tartan itself as a sort of guide for fens that I should measure anything. Um, and if it weren't something like this, flat, I really would do that. One of the things that I needed to check was, okay, is there going to be room to get a sword in there? Because that's basically what it's about and what we need to do. And because I do know roughly what the width of the sword blade is in this case, but again, fiddle, 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 battle. So there I am pinning it where I think it's going to be. And I did end up using this for all of them because thankfully the, the plaid wasn't that far off in its uh, dimensions so that I could use it for all of them. Yay, it worked. So here we are, back to the sewing machine. I do, I must say, I have two uh, singers. My first one is a 301, and it's just a straight stitch, which I use for most of my sewing. Um, if I'm doing a project where I have to switch back and forth, I will use the 401. But here we go. Um, let's see, sewing the little side seam here, and again, I'm wearing something different because you know, uh, the disaster that we had uh, with the footage being lost. Such is life on the internet. So, yeah. Check very carefully every time you stick the needle in the fabric because you're in the right place and you're going only as far as you need to. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of careful, but I do wing things a lot. I don't always, uh, I don't always pin things. I don't pin. So do as I say, not as I do. There we go. to figure out how to get the baldric to lie correctly so that the sword would be in the correct direction. It was a little stressful because the only thing that I had was a broom, so I had to kind of stick that in there, and I was concerned that they would be the correct angle and length for everybody, and as I said, they were all different heights and such. I did try putting it on my dress form and working on it that way, but that really didn't work very well, so I had to do it on myself, as you saw. I realized that there was no way that I was going to be able to fit them for everybody on me, so what I did was I got the angle of where the hooks would go and figured I would corral my son and fit it on him, which is what I did a bit later. And here we are to the hand sewing. You can see in the example on the right-hand side of the screen that I actually did one beforehand because of the footage loss. And this is the second one going on um, with, with uh, getting the angle correct because as you can see, it's not straight across the grain. It's not a bias cut. It's, it's sort of somewhere in between. So I'm sewing these on with um, pearl cotton, actually, number five. I tried button and carpet thread, and that just wasn't even thick enough. The hooks are really big and heavy, and so uh, it needed something really, really sturdy. 
to, uh, to secure it because the swords are lighter than a Highland Claymore, but they're not entirely light. Um, some people don't like the hand show, and I actually do find it quite relaxing. For many years, I didn't have a sewing machine until my grandfather gave me one um, when I was in college, and so I hand sewed everything. And when people ask me, what do you think the greatest invention of all time is? I'm going to say a sewing machine because you can cut down the amount of work by probably 100%. <laughs> if it takes me an hour to sew something by hand, it's going to take me 10 minutes on the sewing machine. And I deeply appreciate that. One of the things that I did hand sew when I had a sewing machine was a little kilt in the toy cotton for my eldest son because he wanted to buy. Now, the tradition of quilt making is very old, obviously, and um, there was an article in Threads magazine on quilt making, and uh, I thought, wow, I'd love to be able to do that someday. And when someday arrived, I decided that even though I could sew the main seams on a sewing machine, that I really didn't want to do that because I wanted the experience of sewing it all by hand in the way that it used to be done. And I took it to work with me. I took it on the bus. I stayed up late at night watching movies and sewed it all by hand. All those tiny little night sleeps, all hand stitched. And um, I had to learn how to work with leather because, of course, these have leather straps that have buckles on them, and I didn't know how to do that. I think I might have ended up using E6000 on those. I don't think I actually used my sewing machine to sew the leather, although you can do that. And since he's wearing it to his wedding, I know that uh, E6000 really does work not just for jewelry. So um, it's kind of a um, an extreme version of stitch witchery, if you know what that stuff is to hem your pants without sewing. One of the courses that I had in my Etsy shop for a long time was on historical hand sewing, and it came with linen fabric and thread and instructions for various stitches, such as the mantle maker's seam and antique hand stitch. And this is one of my most popular uh, male order courses. And I was very pleased when a friend of mine did a special photo shoot on her arm with her antiques around it. Welcome back. What I learned from this project was that, yes, I can really figure out how to do something, even if I've never done it before. I'm a fairly visual learner, and if I can find a picture of what I want, then I can math and fiddle and puzzle my way through it until I get what I want. If I can't do this, then I'll do some research and, or ask uh, some knowledgeable friends what I'm missing. Often, there are fellow anthrotypes who also do experimental archaeology in their lives, so their help is very useful. This was a very encouraging and tremendously empowering little project, because figuring things out like this is, to me, I think, what makes us human. Now, making these baldrics isn't up there with the invention of fire, but when I figured out how they were supposed to hang, I was fairly chuffed. Thanks so much for stopping by, and I hope to see you around on social media. Ta-ta, the new.